Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. Our guest this morning is Darcy James, and we're talking about really life and where you start in life and how your life starts is not the final decision and not the final end on how God decides to use you in this life. Darcy, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Darcy has an incredibly wonderful story. And, you know, a lot of times, especially kids, as we talk about more about mental health and depression, when you come from a family that you didn't choose and that doesn't necessarily have your best interest at heart, it's not necessarily your end. And you're a testament to that. Take us back to growing up. And that's so true. And uh, growing up for me uh, was very difficult. And it's interesting when that's all you know, you don't really even realize it's difficult. I remember I was probably in the sixth or seventh grade before I realized like this is not probably what you would call a normal home. And so my dad was alcoholic. My mom was um, there, but not there. You know, very, a lot of emotional issues. And when did you know that it was your house was different from maybe kids at school? I remember in sixth grade was like the first time and I had, um, it was after a, a, a ball tournament, a weekend of ball tournament, and I was looking at kids after the game and it was like kind of just the light went on. I looked around and their parents were hugging them and congratulating them and you know, that kind of thing. And I would just get this stare and this look and I knew, you know, it was just a very hard, angry, you know, uh, never was good enough, you know. I was a good athlete, you know, had a lot of success in a lot of ways, but it was never good enough. And so I remember thinking like, you know, something, it just something's different. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and then, you know, things were very, very, very difficult at home. And so at home, when you finished playing ball and you were met with the problems of home, mm -hmm. and tell me about those problems and how those problems really affected your life. Yeah, I, you know, I get home, uh, you know, school and sports were kind of my escape. When I got home, it was like a whole nother life, you know, and I'd be out in public, you know, against uh, functions or whatever. And, you know, you put on just kind of this game face in a way. When I got home, uh, you know, dad was very, very abusive in, in every way. And um, so, like I said, with sports and stuff, I never was good enough. So when I got home, you know, I, he'd make me go running. He'd make me, I'd have to go play basketball for two hours and go shoot and do whatever. And a lot of times I'd just be kicked out. I wouldn't be able to come. If I played bad, I was an embarrassment to the family. I'd be kicked out for the night. I grew up in Montana, so there'd be just some cold, cold nights. rough, rough nights. And uh, then get up and go to school, you know, go to school in the same clothes, go to school and, you know, just, you know, you just get up and go. What'd you think and, about that? Did you think other kids were getting kicked out because they... Or an embarrassment to their Well, family. you know, like again, around that time is when I realized that, you know, things were different. And um, I, really there was so much fear in the home. So my dad, one, some of his famous statements were what goes on in our home stays in our home. And, you know, uh, just he would put his, you know, finger in your face and get in your face and, and, uh, and then, you know, physically was very abusive. So you knew, you know, that not you dare not anybody. talk. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so he would threaten our lives. He would, uh, many times he threatened my life and it was just, and you knew like there was, but that was from the earliest moments of my life I can remember was just old, terrified, just like a, an, an environment of terror, of fear, um, you know, and surely never would tell anybody because I knew what he was capable of, so. And so how do you function at school? <sighs> I look back and that's one of the things that really like baffles me is how you c I could live two complete different lives. You know, you go to school and it's like, again, that was a place I could breathe you know, I knew I was safe for eight hours, but um, the, to be able, how I was able to focus on, I really don't even know. And now I look back and I really believe the hand of God and he, that his hand was on me during those times and his grace was on me. But, um, oh, I was a mess, you know, very, I couldn't cry. I wasn't allowed to have emotions really or anything, but just kind of just struggling through. I did have some teachers that were super supportive and I really clung to people that showed any interest in me. And uh, not in a, like a messed up way, but just that were supportive. That like I had some coaches that were just, you know, super. Was there a time at school that, that teachers kind of 
knew something mm -hmm. is just not right. I, I, it's funny because later, now, later in my life, I've gone back and I still have a relationship with a lot of these people. And it's interesting because I had several people say, we all knew something was going on. And one time they did, I, DFS was called, I think, or you know, social services or whatever it was called. And they sent a letter to my dad. And they said, you know, we suspect you're abusing your daughter, Darcy. And that letter showed up on a Friday. And that was one of the worst weekends of my life. And so he thought I had told, and I had no told. clue. I had no clue. He was talking, you know, I got home and it was like thrown in my face and he took me for a drive and it was, it was absolutely awful. And so, and I was so confused because I, I hadn't told and, you know, mm -hmm. so somebody had, to, so then that Monday he went to school and ended up meeting with the principal and the whole thing just kind of disappeared. Nobody, you know, followed through. Nobody talked to me. I don't even know though if I would have told the truth, you know, honestly. But um, you know, so I th later I learned that a lot of the teachers suspected, um, you know, things that were going on. But it's a hard thing to get involved in. It's hard, something no one wants to get involved in. Uh, it's messy, you know. If it's not true, then it's a, you know. But it's um, it's a hard thing for people to get well, involved. Was in. there anything that you could that you could that you knew to do as a child that would quail your dad's anger? Um, I just tried to do whatever he wanted. You know, that, that ended up being, I, 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 there was times that I would kind of fight back a little bit or, you know, I kind of would like hit my boiling point or something, you know, and, and when he would get real angry and maybe try to, you know, but I learned quickly that was not the answer. Mm -hmm. And so he was going to have his way. And so it was just, it became, and probably when I was, after I tried to, uh, in eighth grade, things got so bad that I ended up trying to take my own life and ended up in a mental hospital. And um, what happened when, when you try to take your life and what, where, where do your parents, where do they fall in that situation? Because obviously they're very, they're very sick. Mm -hmm. people. They are. And I think they really just didn't have the capacity to, to really to parent, you know, mm -hmm. honestly. But um, so when the, when they I remember when they first came, uh, my mom cried, you know, some and my dad gave me that look that, you know, I knew what that look meant, you that know, look, that you better not you tell better, anybody. You better you get better, it together. You better pull get, it together. Pull it together. You better, you know, you better not talk. You better not tell anybody what's going and on. And you knew what he I meant. I knew. One, Without saying he, a word. He walked in the room. When I knew that they were coming, we had a couple family meetings with the, the doctors and the teams there at the mental hospital. And I would just be sick before he come. But I knew that I, he just, all he had to do is give him one look. You know, and I knew what that meant. And so I never told anybody there what was going on or anything. But after that, it really, that broke me, I think. Like, mm -hmm. so after that, it was just whatever he wanted to do, he did. And I didn't fight after that hardly. Like maybe a few times there was, you know, a few situations specifically, but it was just go along with it because just to get through it. And I just had my eyes on, I can't wait to get out of the house, you know. And I, I remember it was 14, 15. It was like, all right, I got like three more years, you know, I got. And then, uh, so. What was the relationship between your siblings? Were they undergoing the same kind of torment? My dad had a real issue with women. And so I had an older brother, then there was me, and then I had a younger brother and a lot younger sister. So uh, my older brother and I were very close. And for a long time, he was like the protector kind of. He tried to, he really couldn't do much. He did get abused some, but nothing to the extent of like. What was your dad's issue with women? Did you ever find out? I don't know, totally. His dad died when he was eight years old. And so his, he was the only child and his mom raised him. And so I think there was a lot of resentment toward his mom. His mom just kind of let him do, he started drinking at a very, very young age. You know, she would, they had a lot of money at that time. So she would just kind of try to buy his happiness, try to, you know, she wasn't like a, a strict parent that trained and raised him. So I think it started with her and then my mom and then you know so i was the oldest girl so my sister really didn't really didn't get it near as bad because when my parents ended up getting a divorce she was still pretty young and i was in the home most of that time so um but my older brother and i we used to be really tight and he like we would hide from him when he'd go on his drunken mentions and stuff and just you know try to try to make it you mm -hmm. know but and then the, the the sad thing is is he basically followed in the exact footsteps and wow. became an alcoholic in high school and wow. so and so i'm sure though at that time being a young lady a young girl turning into a young woman um doing really well academically and in sports and you endure 
Mm -hmm. And then you get a scholarship mm -hmm. and you go off to college. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is my saving grace? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that was my golden ticket. It that was, was like, your golden ticket. <laughs> I had won the golden ticket. Mm -hmm. And so my whole life I had dreamed of getting out of that house. And I would count the days and count the years. And I was trying to think if I could get out, when I could get out and that kind of thing. But to get a full ride scholarship to go play basketball was a dream. And so I remember I got to college and I was so excited and away from my family. Mm -hmm. And that was probably one of the most disappointing, the biggest disappointments was that year. Why? Because the thing I'd always wanted, the thing I'd, I had dreamed of my whole life of getting out of that home, it didn't bring me peace and it didn't bring me joy. It didn't bring satisfaction. Now, I wasn't being abused every day. That was a blessing. But on the inside, you know, there was still that void. There was still that emptiness, that brokenness, that shame. And so um, that was a very, very, it was a, a fun time, sort of in a sense of just being out of the house, but it was a very disappointing. And like for the rest of my, it was a turning point really, because I realized there has to be something more. If not, I don't want to live. And so you're still broken mm -hmm. and, but you're out of the house. When do you understand that there's something missing that you didn't even know existed, that, mm -hmm. that, that God was there and he had kept you, but mm -hmm. you didn't really even know mm -hmm. about. I didn't really know much about God. You know, here you hear just, you know, little things here and there, but I didn't, I'd never been like really uh, taught about God, anything like that. But in eighth grade, this was one of the turning points was in eighth grade when I got out of the mental hospital after trying to kill myself, I had a teacher that kept me after class, Grady Bennett, and he said, listen, I know you've had a rough go, but God loves you and he has a plan for your life. And those were like arrows in a way that went in my heart and stuck. It was like hope. And our and he, he was a blessing all through high school, just always would encourage me, encourage me about the, What did you, you know, think when he said, God loves you and he has a plan for your life. It was so far off. Like I couldn't bring it into any kind of reality or understanding. Now I understand. Mm -hmm. But um, so it was just something. But it was, it, was, there, it was something different than someone just saying, you know, I'm here for you or, you know, you're going to be OK or you're a tough kid. You know, it was different than any other encouragement I got from anybody. Like those words changed my life. And so I was in college that summer after my freshman year. And uh, man, I was so broken and just so empty. And I remember driving around and on a Saturday night and I was just thinking, I, I just, I'm, I don't wanna live anymore. Like I, and I had been suicidal different times, but I was like, this was like rock bottom. But I kept thinking about that teacher and I kept thinking about those words. Again, it was just like hope, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know, I've tried kind of everything. I've tried do, making it on my own. I had been on a lot of medications at different times. They didn't help. And so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna give this a shot. And so he'd invited me to church. And so I ended up going to church the next day and oh, I gave my heart to Jesus. Did and it you? was so crazy. The, it was like the preacher knew everything. I was, it freaked he me out. He knew your story. He knew my story. His message that day was how to be a giant killer. <laughs> and he went on and on and <laughs> on. And I, it, it like, I was looking around like who told him? And right. I hadn't told I've been anybody. I've keeping this secret I know. for all these years. How yeah. did he know? God had my number that day. God had your number. <laughs> yes. And so when you're sitting there, cause you don't, you, God wasn't a part of your family, mm -hmm. wasn't a part of your life. Mm -mm. But you, you take a chance and you go to church. Mm -hmm. And so when the message is God, like reading your mail, mm -hmm. reading your life yes. story, what do you start to think about this person I, that you had never even really heard about? Yeah, I thought that, okay, if there is an answer, this is it. Like it, it was so supernatural and so real. Mm -hmm. And and I could I could feel in the love, like I could feel like, even the way he delivered, this man delivered, it was an elderly gentleman that was preaching that day, he, the, the pastor of the church. And just the, the way he spoke and, and the way he communicated, like there really is a God that will be with you in trouble and will bring you through trouble. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I think this might, this might be on, I might be on to something here. Uh -huh. And so they gave an altar call. I knew nothing about no altar call. Like I'd never experienced nothing like that. And so they told people to come forward. And so I surely didn't want to do that. But it was like, I didn't care. It was like, I felt like I don't, I didn't, I did not literally run to the altar, but in my heart, I just, you were running. I was running. And I'll never forget the lady that prayed with me at the altar. Uh, I still have contact with her today. And um, it was, everything changed in that moment. Now my life didn't totally, 
my problems didn't go away it wasn't instantaneously. Like waving a magic wand. No, and but boom, there was a good. hope that came in me that changed everything. Were you at that point able to come, not come out of the shame, but were you able to say, this is what I've been through. This is the torment that has been my life. No, it, it took a long, it took a good while for that. It was probably um, maybe three or four years before I really opened up with kind of the, the, to the extent of what had happened. I had, you know, maybe mentioned about being abused or having a rough family, but uh, it took some time. And, uh, but you know, the, the word uh, started to work in me and started to make changes. And it, there was a little bit of, of frustration a few times where it was, you know, I wanted magically everything to be better. And I had kind of an expectation because there had been a change in my heart. And it was like, you almost feel like, you know, you come to God that everything should just be perfect. Right. And that's not true either. Right. But there was a hope and there was a foundation there that was being formed that would bring me through and carry me through the rest of my life. Does that hope and that foundation, does that go in you? And do you want to now share that with your family? Mm -hmm. I do. And, and, and anyone who's in need or anyone who's hurting. And to me, I think about like, there's no one God can't change. There's mm -hmm. no person. I mean, I think like I was at the end of my life. Like I would not be alive had God not intervened and I had not gotten saved. I, I would have, I would have ended my life. I'm certain of that. And so uh, there's no one that God can't change. And so to me, one of my th desires, and I heard Joyce Meyer say that one way to give the devil a black eye is to take the thing that he meant to knock you out and mm -hmm. use it for good. Mm -hmm. And so for me to testify and tell what God's done in my life, that's one way that I win. And the one day that one way that God wins and he gets mm -hmm. the vic, you know, he gets the, it's like the devil doesn't have the last word and he Absolutely. doesn't have to have the last word in our lives, you mm -hmm. know? So how long is it before you're able to forgive all of the rot that is your, your parents, yeah. that all of the torment and all of these years of thinking, I'm just not good enough. Yeah. I'm not, you know, smart enough. I'm not athletic enough. Mm -hmm. I'm not enough of anything mm -hmm. for them. You know, it's, uh, I would say that's, it's a, a process. It's not, again, that's something I remember hearing my first couple messages about that. And uh -oh, I thought, oh gosh, <laughs> uh -oh, I gotta oh them. my goodness, this is, this is not possible. <laughs> but, um, cause I, in my mind, they didn't deserve forgiveness. Right. And but are you, you know what? Are you thinking, God, you don't know what no. they did. You can't yes. know what they you did. You can't <laughs> expect me to, but you know what? It was like, it kind of came down to, you know, they don't deserve forgiveness, but neither did I. And mm. Jesus paid the price for me. And so it, I would say with forgiveness, it's a process, though. I've forgiven by faith. And then, you know, you have to forgive again. And when things will come to my mind or I have nightmares one night or different things will come up and then I have to forgive again. And something will come at a certain time of the year, or memories, mm -hmm. and then you have to forgive again. And so it's a process, forgiveness is. And so, but the thing about forgiveness is it sets you free. It sets them free, you know, it cuts the, you know, kind of binds, that cuts those strings. But really it's, it's, it's more about than just letting them off the hook. It's really letting yourself off the hook. And mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a, it's a challenging thing sometimes. And I'm so glad God gives us the love to love people with. Mm -hmm. It's not just our natural human love, but we can love with the love that he gives us. The reason why we wanted to share Darcy's story is because we know that so many people, we can't choose our family, mm -hmm. but when we allow God to fill that void of everything mm -hmm. that we didn't get, mm -hmm. that we wish that we have, could have gotten, mm -hmm. our lives really turn out okay. Mm -hmm. Because in the natural, statistically, people would have said, there's no real way that you would have had a chance to make it mm -hmm. and to live a successful life. Mm -hmm. But God said, Yes. Yeah. And his grace was enough. Yes. And so then you start to form a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. How does that begin to shift your life away from the brokenness, the sadness, the pain, the uncertainty of why, why God did my life have mm -hmm. to be like this? Yeah, it's really true. And I, um, it's interesting because one of the first things that changed was my priorities. And basketball had been my life and I had a full ride scholarship and I ended up quitting school um, because I was just at such a crossroads and my parents had ended up getting a divorce. They were in the process of a divorce. My mom was sick. So I ended up moving to Colorado just for a short time to help take care of my mom. 
And um, during that time, actually, at a conference, at a church there, a small conference, really small town, small conference, I met uh, Mark and Trina Hankins, who is actually who I work for and uh, who have been my pastors for years. And during that time, it was like kind of just... It, it, that was, you know, there's different keys in our life that kind of unlock new doors. And for me, that was a huge key because it really unlocked the door of like my a new life for me. Mm -hmm. And so I moved from, and it's funny how I believe God just sets this up. I moved from Montana to Colorado to Louisiana, you know, within about a year and a half total. So clear across the country. And I needed a fresh start. And I had spiritually, I got a new start. You know, Second Corinthians five seventeen says, "In man being Christ, there are new creature. Old things are passed away; all things are new." But I really believe God knew I needed a like location change. You know, and so mm -hmm. He He directed me. So it was kind of just learning to, um, you know, uh, learning the Word, learning who I was, but also learning that there are good people. And that there are people that can be trusted. Learning what a family was, you know, being in church, church is, you know, a family. And I have been so blessed by the body of Christ. And, um, you know, the Bible says that he takes the solitary or the ones that are alone and puts them in, puts, and he sets them in families. Mm -hmm. And the Lord takes us up. And oh my goodness, I have experienced that in the most amazing way. And I have so many people that are, are like parents and, you know, the Hankins are that way to me, but so many other people that just have stepped in and played roles, even as a young adult and even in, into adulthood, that I needed those kind of relationships, someone to pray for me, someone to believe with me, someone I could call when, you know, when things were rough. And so it's been a, a tremendous transformation just to like, you know, family's not a horrible thing. Like it, God can restore even that thing. And so uh, it's just cool to see it continually develop. So when you meet them in Colorado, the Hankins, mm -hmm. and, you, and you don't know them mm -hmm. and you've never had yeah. any idea who they are or who they were, when you show up, in Alexandria, Louisiana. How does that happen? So they came to the meeting and um, they had a little brochure on their product table and it's had a, they had a Bible college at the church at Christian Worship Center. And so I, it was this cheesy like flyer with wheat on it. And I was, there was something about it I was drawn to. With and I, wheat? With wheat, yeah. like the end time harvest. <laughs> and so I said, I'm gonna come and go to your Bible school. And I'm sure they're probably told those kind of things a lot when they're out. And I moved here, like not a couple months later, I picked up and I put everything in my car and moved here and I didn't have much. It, there was plenty of room. I didn't have anything. And I moved here to go to Bible school. And I was so hungry for God that I knew God was real. But again, I didn't know much. I didn't, the church I was in was a good church, but I needed to be just like smothered with the word. And so going to Bible school when you're, uh, we had basically 8 a.m. till 12 noon every day. When I, when I went, that's when it, how it was. It's just being totally like saturated with the word, saturated in prayer. We'd have prayer meetings and praise and worship and all of those things really like kind of, I needed like a, so, a heavy dose of it. So, so you needed a heavy dose of the word, but you still got to live. Yes. How does that happen for you? Well, at that point, uh, you know, I worked at nights. So I would work at a restaurant at nights and I would do that and, um, you know, kind of just make things. And then I ended up going to work at the, the ministry and um, just really an amazing environment. Were they surprised like when you show up? They were surprised. And the weird thing is my mom went to high school with Trina Hankins. Oh, wow. And so she was like shocked because she knew my mom. She knew she wasn't a believer. She knew my family history. Like it, they, my family had kind of a reputation for being pretty rough. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that here I am, and it was a small town in Colorado they went to, to school in and, and Brenda Dinas' daughter or, you know, it just was, it was crazy. And so uh, they were, they were very supportive though, and kind of took an, a special interest in me maybe, you know, which I needed mm -hmm. and, you know, God must have known I needed mm -hmm. that. And so we just began to grow together and mm -hmm. it, that's been almost 20 years wow. since I came. So. so, you know, people are wondering, were you able to reconcile with your family? Mm -hmm. Was there, has there been a time of, of reconciliation? You know, there has not been, and I'll say yet, you know, it is something I pray and believe God for, um, you know, just in, I want his will concerning it. But I do know and I have learned that as an adult, you have choices to make. And so I think some people I for years, I would try to go and be around them. I would try because I felt like it was the Christian thing to do, right. you know, that I needed to be around them. I need. But, you know, there's a point when you make choices, you know, as a child, I didn't have a choice. I was forced into that environment. So I, I love from a distance now. 
and I pray for them. And, um, you know, my, my desire is to just live my life to please God uh, and to, to go forward and then, you know, just trust that he's working in that situation. And, uh, but I've had to make some decisions. They've been hard ones, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've had the peace of God and been able to really pray. And, you know, I felt kind of a release from him that, you know, that he would take care of that and I could, could move on with my life. So, so here's what I want you to do, Darcy. I want you to look in that camera right there. And I want you to speak to people that have been so broken from sexual abuse and physical abuse, and they think that God is not there. I want you to tell them about the God that met you and filled you and healed you. Mm -hmm. Tell them about that God. Yes, praise God. So it doesn't matter what you've been through. You know, I, I don't know that my life could have been at any lower of a point possible. And um, that brokenness, the shame, the, the, all that goes along. If you're in that place right now and you, you're dealing with that, you're experiencing that, I want you to know that God, He is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. He's not the one that causes the trouble. The devil is a mean devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life. So God, He is with you. And the great thing about God is you can call unto Him and He will answer. And so I encourage you, first of all, there is hope to get out of those situations. And if you are in that situation, you do not have to stay. God will provide a way of escape. He'll get, get you out of it. And like for me, you know, it, it didn't happen overnight, but he did get me out of it. And I believe his hand was upon me during that time. But then also, uh, he is so faithful uh, to put you back together. And he doesn't, you know, when I got saved, everything became new for me. But there was a long process, and it's been a 20-year process, really, of him putting me back together. But he is a restorer. He is faithful. He is a lover of your soul. He will bring comfort and peace and strength when you need it the most. So I encourage you to turn your heart toward God. And it's not hard. You just call out to him. You know, at the mention of his name, he is there. And he, he brings peace and joy that I've never had known in my life. And I, the great thing is he's not a respecter of persons. If he did it for me, then I know he can do it for you. I love it. <laughs> I love it. He is the lover yes, of our soul. He is. Darcy, thank you for sharing thank your you. heart. And thank you for sharing with all of us how God can take anything that's broken mm -hmm. and he can fix it. Yes, yes. Indeed.
think that Darcy's story really speaks life and hope to so many people who just felt that their childhood was unfair, that felt that they got the short end of the stick, that felt so broken and so torn that you literally thought your possibilities didn't exist. Now, Darcy and I talked a long time about her life on and off camera and the struggles and the challenges. And at that point in her life, when she was a young girl becoming a young woman, not knowing anything about this great God that could save her, she dealt with, why am I here? Do I have a purpose? How could anybody love me when my parents, the people who were supposed to protect and care for me, didn't? And she even toiled with taking her life. And every story that we're able to share, like Darcy's, when a young person has so many mountains to climb, what the devil meant for evil, those stories give life and hope and show that redemption is possible. And that if you just don't quit, God will always have a ram in the bush to be there, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a coach, whether it's a mentor. And her story speaks to, you don't have to wallow in that place from which you came. You don't have to wallow in woe is me. So many of us start out with challenges, but those challenges help to make us strong. And I know it, it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. But what we have to know is that there is a greater plan for each and every one of our lives. And Darcy was able to push through. She was able to withstand all of the abuse that came from so many directions. And I'm sure there was a time where she felt like nobody in the world loved her. But there was that one person, that one ram in the bush that said, God loves you. And at that moment, she felt so unloved and so broken by her circumstances that she was able to grab hold of that love of God. And then she started going to church and she started hearing about this great God. And you know, God is so perfect and he perfects those things that concern us so wonderfully that there was a word one day at the church that was tailor fit for her. She gave her life to Christ and then she started seeking after him. She started understanding that he had a great plan for her life. And she started to want to live and seek after that purpose. And it took some twists and turns. And when you give your heart and your life to Christ, your life doesn't change instantaneously. But what happens is there is a connection. There is a spiritual connection that once you lean in, that's the new verbiage that the world is using. But when you lean in to the one, your possibilities start to open. And today, what Darcy can do is minister to others who felt like and who feel like there is no hope. And what I love about every story that we are so blessed to share is that every story gives life and hope to the next story. And the resounding theme for me in this final point is hope. 
there is always hope. No matter what your circumstances, no matter what type of abuse that you've endured, there is help and there is hope. And I know that this word, this testimony, this story is for somebody. We just don't know who it is. But for you, I would say your life is important. God created you for a reason and a purpose. And now you have to start the work, start the process of healing. And you don't ever really forget the pain, but what Darcy was able to do over time is to forgive the people who were supposed to have her back, who were supposed to love her. Now she's not in fellowship with her parents now, but she forgives them, she prays for them, and in God's time, I believe they will reconcile. Maybe not in the sense that most people think of reconciliation, but forgiving those people who hurt you and who despitefully use you, I think it's the first step. Darcy was able to do it. Now she's ministering to those who are broken and hurt so that they can do the same thing and they can get on to the business of living life on purpose. And that, my friends, is my final point on point today.